My guest today is Robert Gordon. His new film, Best of Enemies, looks at the famous political debates between William F. Buckley and Gore Vidal. This 1968 presidential debate between the two political commentators is now considered as a template for the current political debates that we see on TV. Hello and welcome to the show, Robert. Welcome to San Francisco. In some ways, this is where it all started, the Gore Vidal and uh, Buckley feud. Uh, They met here in 1964 during the uh, Republican convention where Goldwater was nominated. The feud actually had its roots. Going backwards, in 1962, they had done a press debate, each taking a column on the left and on the right. And then prior to that, uh, Vidal had been on the David Susskind program and then the Jack Parr program speaking less than nicely about this young Republican upstart named uh, William F. Buckley Jr. and on Jack Parr, William Buckley demanded equal time and uh, made his first national TV appearance, thanks to Gore Vidal. Best of Enemies is the documentary that you've made, and that's what we are talking about. It is the sparks that flew off between Gore Vidal and William Buckley. And uh, you mentioned uh, Jack Parr. What was interesting is that he had given a very different picture of uh, Buckley to Parr. He had called him troglodyte, I think, is the term that was used. And Pa was pleasantly surprised and, I think, charmed by Buckley. Yes, I'm not sure. Uh, One of our commentators uses troglodyte to describe Gore's description of Buckley um, because that would have been a reasonably accurate description of the right wing in the late 1950s and early 60s in the sense of the right wing then being under the control of the John Birch Society, um, people who were saying that uh, the president was a communist, secret member of the Communist Party under communistic influence, Re- uh, Jew haters, right wing in the late 1950s was difficult for an intellectual like Buckley to align himself with. And Buckley's great achievement was to reconfigure the the right to uh, establish an intellectual philosophy that others could join with and create a movement in America that saw its ultimate expression with Ronald Reagan's election in 1980. So we'll step back. The the, the film is actually about the uh, 1968 elections and ABC was lagging behind and they came up with this brilliant strategy of having a 90-minute talk show between Vidal and Buckley, guys at two opposite ends of the spectrum, both elitists, both uh, well-heeled, well-read folks. And it was that conversation that sparked off what we see today on TV as talk shows. How did you go from making films on music to politics? Mm -hmm. One slight correction is that it was a ABC had a 90-minute program each night, 15 minutes of which each night were devoted to Vidal and Buckley, but it was all more conversational. The other networks accused ABC of uh, foregoing its journalistic standards by not covering the convention gavel to gavel, but after this year, 1968, none of the networks did gavel to gavel anymore. They emulated ABC. Well, my films have been, and books, have been about musicians, largely, or musical moments, they've all taken the artist or the moment and examined the culture behind it. It's never just about the music. It's about the culture that created the music. It's a context. It's a context, a bigger, it's a, it's about the social issues behind the context. So all that is going on here really is that the music is the debates between Vidal and Buckley, and then we go into how each one came to these opinions, what they represented at the time, and their impact on modern television today. That impact being that the ratings went up for Vidal and Buckley. As the catfight screeched louder, more people tuned in, and that made the networks aware that Prior to this point, political talk shows were five men sitting around a table. You know, it was kind of dull. And um, there were no sparks. There were no sparks. And this this said, sparks are okay. 
and what we see now is you know just the fireworks there's no with these guys there was real there was a fear of each other each thought the other's worldview was going to take down america whereas now I think they just fear the other because it's the other. The Republicans fear the Democrats, the Democrats fear the Republicans because they're across the aisle and they forget the, you know, the goal of trying to um, create policy that takes the country forward. 1968 was a turning point. You know, Nixon was running for elections and Buckley he played a key role, as you pointed out, in uh, reconfiguring the conservative movement of the Republican Party. What is it that he did? And if he was to be alive today, and if he looked at your film, what would he say about the film and about the Republican Party? Does religion have the same connotation, for instance, that Buckley had? Today, religion has a different connotation depending which part of the U.S. you live in. For instance, you live in Tennessee, mm -hmm. so maybe religion has a different connotation. Maybe in California it has a different connotation. When you're saying Re religion because in terms there the, of because there is party the, policy? There is a uh, sliding scale of where you are and when you, when you talk about religiosity is what I'm thinking about, you know, okay. the degree of religiosity. So is that the same thing that Buckley had in mind? You know, when he said he was a Catholic and he believed in the church and the Bible and everything. And so what I'm saying, he was not, he, he didn't wear blinkers. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. That's what, I think that's okay. the notion of religion I'm getting at. Okay. So we, we've got two parts to the question, Buckley, Buckley being alive today and what he would think of the film and the, and the Republican Party and then the religion question. So Buckley being alive today Obviously, it's purely speculation. My sense is that he would like the film um, because it is a serious and unbiased portrayal of a time that allowed for more in-depth debate, which is sorely lacking from the media today. And his thoughts on the Republican Party, I think, would be that he sees the party going back to the kind of party that he reconfigured in the 50s and 60s. That is, the Tea Party is, and, and the far right is pulling the Republican Party back toward um, bias, racial bias, economic bias, seeing all these things that he tried to change. It's, the Republican Party seems to be retreating back to that. Um, and Buckley and religion. Buckley was a man of great faith, um, and he was a Catholic. And that's important because Catholics, as I understand Catholics, uh, believe that action is the most important thing, action more than thought. So Buckley lived a life, tried to do what he believed he should do. Now, you bring out the, the instance of his wife being um, a uh, friendly with many gay men. And Bill once said, uh, if there's 10,000 um, gay men in, in America, I think I know at least half of them or something like that because she, that was the circle she ran. And she was a fundraiser for many of Manhattan's finest museums. There was a lot of gay culture at the time. This was at a time, of course, when gay culture was not accepted and being out, people weren't out. Bill did unto others as he would want them to do unto him. That is, he was kind to people who were different from him. Um, and, and, and even liberals talk about that. Bill, Bill, my understanding, I never met Buckley, but my understanding from talking to his friends is that off camera, he didn't like to talk about politics, and he liked to hang out with people who were, he liked to hang out with liberals because they were more interesting to him. They talked about, he, Bill's interests were wide, musical, artistic, read a lot, you know, in uh, his history. So he didn't want to get bogged down in the thing. You know, politics, writing about politics, thinking about politics, that was a job. He liked to be beyond that, outside of that. So um, unlike Gore, I think Gore, what you kind of Gore said, I'm a I'm a, a a man of ice. If you cut open my veins, you know you would find cold water 
or something like that. He talked about his icy interior. Um, and in a way, I think he had to kind of work at that. To main, That was an image he wanted to have that he fought to maintain. But it wasn't a difficult fight. I think he really was that kind of um, really icy. cold and mean, mean person who liked to come in and uh, give the kind of social criticism that made people start. And because I think he appreciated that upsetting people is a good way to make them think. And Gore certainly liked to think and liked for others to think. And you actually had an opportunity to interview Gore Vidal uh, during his last days. What was it like? Was he really icy or was he warm? <laughs> Gore, we interviewed Gore in around 2010 or 2011. Uh, within, I think, a year or 18 months of his death. He was already in great decline. He was in a uh, wheelchair. We lit the room. The manservant came down and said, are you ready for Mr. Vidal? We said, yes, please bring him in. Gore was brought in on a wheelchair. Um, he didn't raise his eyes to look at anybody, and he just was looking at the ground as he was getting placed, and someone on the crew said, my uncle fought in the Aleutian Islands at the same time you did during World War II. He said he could never get warm. And with that, Gore raised his eyes, and like, and machine guns popped out of the turrets, and he said, I had my rage to keep me warm. <laughs> I was like, wow, okay, hello, Mr. Vidal. Um, and the interview proceeded at the same kind of level. I actually think, it's my theory, Gore Vidal was interviewed all his life. One of the um, famous things he said was, two things you never say no to are sex and appearing on television. So Gore had uh, been interviewed consistently throughout his life. Oh, well, oh, well, he misquoted Socrates mm -hmm. and said the, uh, a, a, an untelevised life is not worth living. I'm botching it. Sorry, uh, but he was he it's like he, an he unexamined life. yes yes he was making a play on on the examined life and the televised life. So uh, he knew how to be interviewed. And in our interview, early on, he he lashed out at us and called us Buckleyites, and um, and we said actually you know we weren't that we were making a, an, a non-partial and impartial view of this. It was really about the impact of that meeting. But his answers were such that they couldn't, he knew how to answer in a way that it would not allow to be edited well. And he did that for about two hours. It was a real, it took a lot of work from him to not give us what we wanted, but I, he did it. <laughs> and so we didn't have a matching interview with Bill Buckley either from that age. We just felt like that might throw in, that might tip the balance by showing an intimate interview with Gore at that age that we did, might tip the balance. And we, we really worked hard to not take a side in this piece. And in the film, uh, somebody points out that the whole purpose of Vidal Gore being on that show was to basically dismantle Buckley's personality and show that he was a sham or something to that effect. Basically show the negative side of Buckley. Do you think he succeeded in doing that? What you're referring to is a quote from one of Bill's friends, Lee Edwards, uh, historian for the Heritage Foundation, says that he thinks Gore was there to take down Bill. And... Um, I think that that's not untrue, you know, that there's truth in that. Um, Gore, the, the reason that the uh, enmity between Buckley and Vidal is so powerful is that each recognize the intellectual rigor of the other and each recognize the social power of the other. Bill, I think, wielded more social power than Gore as the shaper of, of a party. Um, Gore had the potential, Gore's novels sold better. Something like Myra Breckenridge could have a great impact, shorter term in a way, than what Bill was doing. 
but um, but I think they really did feel like taking out the other one would could save the world. It was it was kind of um, superheroish each each perception of the other. So um, I think Gore was there. Gore wasn't there to defend the Democrats, but he was there to speak from the liberal, from his interpretation of what, uh, of from his liberal interpretation. And if that meant that Bill had to be taken down, Gore was more than happy to, to do that. Well, why did you make this film now? Because next year is election year and talk shows, you know, have proliferated all uh, cable channels. I'm wondering why you made this film now. We got the idea to make the movie in 2010 and set out to raise funds and hope to have it on air and in theaters by the 2012 elections. But in documentary world, things are often more difficult than they seem. And it took us four full years to raise the funds to make the m movie. So the reason we made it now is because we got funded to make it now. Um, we we're very excited that the timing fits well with elections because this is a show, this is a movie based on election time. It's set during the Republican and Democratic conventions. Uh, and and we love that it will have that that echo in time when it resonate with the full cycle of electoral politics. When was the first time you saw Firing Line, and when was the first time you read Gore Vidal's book? I watched Firing Line as a kid, unable to understand a word of what was said. It came on on Sunday mornings in Memphis, and there were three channels, and I'd get up early, and you'd be flicking that TV, and it was Preacher on one, Preacher on the other, and then Bill Buckley. And Bill would be, you know, stretched out in his chair and cigarette smoke curling up through the screen. And his mannerisms were so compelling. It was just like, as a kid, it was, you know, it wasn't cartoons, but it was close, you know. And so I liked that. And I, I didn't understand it, but it was something, it was, it was a treat for the eye. So Buckley, I've known about Buckley all my life. Um, gore. I want to say that um, I didn't really, I mean, Gore Vidal wrote thick novels that were on every, that were in every household library in the 60s and the 70s. And I was a kid in the 60s and 70s. So my parents had the books, all their friends had the books. I was aware of all that. I didn't um, read Gore maybe until college. Um, and what I have found is that I like Gore's nonfiction more than I like his fiction. There's a book he's got on the Founding Fathers that's excellent, Yale University Press, and I can never think of the title of the book, but it's, I highly recommend it. Did you ever read any of uh, Buckley's books at all? I read some of his nonfiction, but not his fiction. Um, I didn't read any of the Blackford Oaks novels. Um, God and Man at Yale, you know, uh, when I read it in the in the past few years was really the first time I read it, and um, it felt, you know, dated to me a little bit. But I also read some of Buckley's shorter stuff, you know, his columns. In a way, I think he was a great columnist. Uh, he could really develop an argument and give it an impact in you know, eight hundred words, and, th and there's that's a real art. Gore as well, you know, his. Gore is uh, reputed to be America's finest essayist. And um, I think that, you know, again, it's there's an art to that. There's a beautiful art to the long form. There's a beautiful art to the short form. And uh, both are to be recognized and appreciated. I want to go back to something that I think one of the people in the film said, that USA is famously anti-intellectual country. And yet there was this debate between two intellectuals that drew a vast number of people to the TV sets, you know, every evening to watch the, uh, the, the, the conversation between mm -hmm. the two of them. And it was also this conversation that went on to form what we call identity politics. Do you think both of them were aware of this identity politics uh, issue and strand? No, and I think, I think identity politics is certainly a term and a concept that came well after them. Um, in terms of being anti-intellectual, uh, 
you know, my my naive hope with this film is that networks and audiences will will see that there's a real there, there's a real excitement in having intellectuals engage that it may not be it may not have the same uh, you know it's not like watching a fireworks show it's not like watching people on McLaughlin Report yell at each other or Crossfire or whatever the show may be um, but that it is that there's a real excitement to it to hear two people sharpen each other's minds with opposing ideas and perhaps networks will go back to giving people time for that it, it, it requires taking your eye off the bottom line for a minute because you can't these ideas and these exchanges need time to s s develop minutes you know so if you're cutting to a commercial every two and a half or four and a half minutes you're not going to really allow it if you're not going to give someone like th they had 15 uninterrupted minutes on national tv that's time to really develop something now i'm not saying networks will go back to 15 uninterrupted minutes on a regular basis but allow more time uh, and allow people to develop the ideas and not just come in and start throwing barbs. And I think that it would make, uh, I think it would educate the audience and have the r ripple effect such that conversations at the dinner table in bars, you know, over at the at the water cooler would have a, a, a raised level of substance. So your hope is uh, to raise the level of debate mm -hmm. around politics. Do you think in today's uh, TV and cable uh, world, are there any uh, folks that you think come remotely close to Buckley or Gorvadal in terms of uh, the punditry, the TV punditry, as you put it in the movie? I can't think of anyone who brings quite what they brought to it. Some of the people I listen to, there's a KCRW podcast called Left, Right, and Center, which... Uh, allows for the development of ideas. Three or four people have a discussion. Um, they, in a half hour, they try to cover two or three or four major issues. Uh, Bob Shear is one of them. He, he has a great wealth of knowledge and at his fingertips, and that's exciting. I like uh, on NPR, E.J. Dion and David Brooks on Fridays have a little back and forth, and you get a sense of what's really going on. They bring something to it. Uh, things like the, you know, actual political debates, I find where it's, we're coming up into a season of, uh, of the elections and we'll be seeing presidential debates and vice presidential debates. And I feel like there, ever since 1968, uh, the making of the president, who's the Fox guy? Uh, founder of Fox. Uh, um, yes, I'm blanking on his name. How embarrassing. He, he was the, yes, recently. Um, but he was also the one who shaped Nixon's campaign in 68. And I feel like since then, there's been, I mean, we saw it in John McCain's run for president. He was a real maverick who, the longer he was on the campaign trail, the more he began to state views that had been antithetical to what he stood for because he thought this is what will sell. And and so I feel like so many people in debates are just trying to tell the audience what they want to hear in order to win the audience's favor or vote. And, um, you know, what John Kennedy had the book Profiles in Courage, people who stood up to and, and maintained their beliefs when uh, it was going to cost them. I think that's, you know, there's there's a real strength in that. And we as a nation would do well to go back to looking for those kind of people. I think the last line in the film is, the Buckley-Vidal debate was the harbinger of an unhappy future. Why did you settle on that line? And how long did you mull on putting that line in the film? My partner, Morgan Neville, and I always saw, immediately saw in these debates from 1968, 40-plus years ago, they felt very contemporary. We immediately saw this as a way to talk about today. But when we were trying to raise the money, people were saying, wow, it's so interesting, but is it relevant? And since the film has been finished and showing around, people, the response we keep getting is, wow, we can't believe how contemporary and irrelevant it is. So I think that people see the roots of the contemporary culture wars 
in the antagonism between these two guys. We wanted to let audiences develop their own contemporary analogies and at the end affirm it for them. And we toyed with in the edit, in the edit you try everything, in the edit we tried bringing in the contemporary aspect earlier and it didn't, it, it didn't work. And when we held it to the end, it seemed to work really well. Um, as a viewer, I think you like to develop your own ideas, and then you don't mind knowing by the end that you're in sync with what the filmmakers were thinking too. And um, that quote by Eric Alterman uh, took us, was a great way to turn, it's the beginning of the end of the movie. Um, it takes us into the modern age and it works so well and we didn't have to mull it much at all because it takes us from the past to the present and allows us to do this ending explication that affirms the notions people have had. What is next for you? What's next for me? Um, you know, the only way to make a living that I have found to make a living in this world of documentary and books is to keep a lot of plates in the air at one time. So I've got a possible book project. I've got one, two, three, two or three documentaries, a couple TV projects, and a narrative and a, a feature film. So somewhere in there, something will happen. Right now, I'm doing a bunch of shorts that I had obligated myself to some years back, and people have been very patient. And I'm within a couple of weeks, hope to hope to have them off my plate so I can look ahead even further. You have a fondness for music. You live in Memphis, Tennessee, you know, mm -hmm. a town known for its music. What was the last CD or new track you heard? Uh -huh. I w worked with a girl named Frazee Ford, who's from Canada, and uh, I heard her on the radio one day, and her voice was so unusual, and I thought she really sounded like uh, a high records recording artist. She was a contemporary singer. And, but she sounded like someone who had listened to these high records, which is a label out of Memphis that Al Green was on. And I tracked her down and said, you, you know, you sound great. You would really sound great with the high records band. And, she's, and it turned out that that had been a, a dream of hers. And so I worked with her management and producer and label to bring them down, bring her down to record with them. The record came out at the end of last year called uh, Indian Ocean. And it's um, a beautiful sounding piece that's very contemporary, but also, you know, you can feel the roots in the past. You made a film on Muddy Waters. And this is my last question. Okay. What is your favorite Muddy Waters track? I'm going to go for the remake, oddly, of um, Manish Boy, which is the opening track on his comeback record called Heart Again. And for me as a kid in 1979 or 8 when that record came out or 7 when that record came out, that was, I had known Muddy Waters, but I'd never owned any of his records. I read a review of that. I bought it and just loved it. Got to see Muddy a number of times after that and got to go backwards in his career from there. And this is the hundred and... Some people are celebrating the 100th anniversary of Muddy's birth this year. I think my research showed it's his 102nd birthday, but I'm just happy that Muddy is remembered so long after he's gone. Thank you so much. I could talk about music with you for another hour, but, but we are running out of time. Thank you so much, and all the best with your film. Thanks very much. Enjoyed it.